Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever struggled with overeating, maintaining your weight, or getting healthy, then do we have the Never Binge Again show for you. Today I'll be talking with Glenn Livingston, PhD, a veteran psychologist, consultant, and researcher, and the author of a fascinating book on eating, Never Binge Again. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about reprogramming your mind to stop overeating and unhealthy eating and to stick to the food plan of your choice. That plus we'll talk about pig troughs, pig slop, pig squealing, inner pigs traveling 100 miles an hour through a yellow light, and what in the world to do if you fall off the pig wagon. So welcome to the show, Glenn. Are you ready to shine? I sure am. That has to be the best introduction I've had. Thank you, Michael. I've been looking forward to this all week. Thank you so much. And a mighty pig. (laughs) Woohoo! So before we dive right into things, what was your relationship with food growing up? Um, I would say it was pretty bad. I... You would diagnose it today as exercise bulimia, which means, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm 6'4", and I was always fairly muscular. And I thought I had a superpower because I discovered if I worked out for two and a half or three hours a day, I could eat whatever I wanted to, Mm -hmm. you know, six, 7,000 calories a day, two whole pizzas, boxes of muffins, um, you know, lattes, chocolate bars, whatever I really wanted to have. And because I come from a family of psychologists, there are literally 17 of us in our family, counselors, therapists, psychiatrists, social workers. Wow. Um, every – when I got older and I found I was not able to stop overeating, um, even though I didn't have the time to exercise three hours a day anymore, I was seeing patients and I was married and et cetera, et cetera. I had adult responsibilities. I, I found I couldn't stop thinking about food. I found I couldn't stop eating you know, five, six, seven thousand calories a day. And so what happened was I got much heavier. Mm -hmm. Um, At one point I weighed 260 pounds, almost 260 pounds. My triglycerides went way up. The doctors were telling me that I was likely going to have a heart attack before I was 35 or 40 years old. And because I come from a family of psychologists, I went a very psychological route to try and fix it. I am... I went to the best doctors around. I went to Overeaters Anonymous. I, I did what most people in our culture do today, which is try, try to love themselves then. I, I really believe that if I could figure out where this great big hole came from inside of me, um, you know, it wasn't going to be what I was eating. It was what was eating me. And if I could love myself enough, then I wouldn't need to overeat anymore. Um, I was also a consultant for... Uh, a lot of big food companies at the time. So I don't have kids. I've never commuted. I've always worked from home. So I had a very extensive career. And I learned an awful lot, not only about what goes on in the big food industry, and we can talk about that later mm-hmm. and how that's contributing to the problem, but I learned an awful lot about how to do studies to figure things out. And I conducted my own food study. I, I self-funded it the, during the days when the internet clicks were cheap. And I, I asked 40,000 people, um, all about their personality and life satisfaction and the types of foods that they had trouble stopping once they started. Mm -hmm. And I I looked at things like, what do people who have trouble with chocolate like I do, what do they tend to suffer with? And it turned out they tended to suffer with more loneliness and heartbreak. And so I, um, you know, I kind of dug deep into my past and I thought, well, yes, I'm lonely and I'm kind of in a bad marriage. I'm, I'm divorced now. Um, and I also dug deep into my past. I asked my mom, who's a therapist, does this mean anything to you? Because I have a real problem with chocolate. And she said, you know, Glenn, when you were about two years old and you were a toddler, you would come to me crying. But my, my husband, your dad, was in the army. We were very scared he was going to be sent to Vietnam. My father, your grandfather, was missing for nine months. And I was very depressed and very overwhelmed. And I just didn't have it in me to hold you and feed you the way that I needed to. So I kept this bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup on the floor in in the refrigerator, right? Um, And I would say, go get your Bosco. Glenn, just go go get your Bosco. And so um, now that was a very worthwhile conversation to have because it made me forgive myself. It brought me closer to my mom. It showed me where the match was struck. How how did this fire start? Um, But it didn't put out the fire. I still had a lot of difficulty controlling myself with chocolate and I'd still be sitting with, you know, suicidal patients where I really needed to be 100% present thinking about 
when can I go get a couple of chocolate bars? The reason that didn't fix things was because there was this little voice inside of me that said something like, um, you know, Glenn, you're right. Your mama didn't love you enough and your father didn't love you enough. And there's this great big hole inside of you. And until you can figure out how to plug that hole and find the love of your life, you are going to have to go right on binging on chocolate. And, and it turned out that it was that voice that I had to learn how to control. I didn't, have to, I didn't really have to figure out why I overate. I didn't have to be a detective to figure out where the match was struck. I needed to be a fireman to figure out how to put out the fire. And it turned out that putting out the fire had to do with um, dealing with that voice. And I can talk a little bit more about how I discovered that voice and you know, some work with patients and clients. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear how you discovered it. And it's when I read your book at first, I, I, I've got to be honest, my head snapped back because I believe in kind, gentle, easy, good and taking the most loving approach you can. With that said, I was a professional bicycle racer for many years and I struggled with an eating disorder. And, and I knew that for myself, for a while, I don't need it now, but for a while, I needed hard set lines. And if I didn't have those lines, that gray area crushed me. And, and so the more I read your book, you're going at the beginning, don't hang in there. Don't put the book down yet. Hang in there. <laughs> hang in there. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's, I, I guess I want to dive into that, why it's not necessarily a love yourself, why it's not at all a love yourself approach. But how did you figure this out? Okay. Um, well, None of the psychological approaches worked for me personally, and I found it didn't work for my patients either. I had very interesting soulful conversations which healed other parts of their lives, but it didn't really work for them. And so I started to look for alternative addiction treatments. Mm -hmm. um, so after going through a couple of years of Overeaters Anonymous and all the psychology, I looked at alternatives, and I, I came across a man named Jack Trimpey, who was the author of a book called Rational Recovery. And he was probably the first to point out, not in these words, I'm paraphrasing him, that it's not really possible to love yourself out of an addiction, and that it's actually the wrong approach. And basically, he said, um, it's because of our neuroanatomy. He said, really, the seat of addiction is, is the lizard brain or the brain stem. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm adding in some other things that I know about neuroanatomy. The, the brain stem, the lizard brain, it, it only knows three things when it sees something in the environment. This is from a time in our, in our evolution when survival was about, do I eat it, do I mate with it, or do I kill it? Do I eat with it, do I mate with it, or do I kill it? There was no love or soulfulness or long-term goals or creativity or spirituality or human connection. This was just eat, love, or kill. Th then there's the mammalian brain, which evolved millions of years later and can inhibit the lizard brain in order to take into consideration the concerns of the tribe. So the tribe or the herd or the family. So before I eat, mate, or kill, how is this going to impact you know, my, my mate, my kids, the immediate family around me? Mm -hmm. And then, then there's what we think of more logically as, as the logical brain of the neocortex. And this is the seat of long-term goals and aspirations and soulfulness and creativity and art and music and all the things which are more distinctly human. And um, Trimpey kind of lumps the bottom two together and says, the problem in addiction is that this thing gets control. And if we talk more about how industry has created these hyperpalatable, concentrated food-like substances, which are really intended to stimulate the pleasure centers in the lower brain, um, beyond what evolution has prepared us for. And I can talk about some studies which show what happens when, when we do that. Um, and what happens is this thing kind of knocks out the logical brain. Mm -hmm. It even knocks out the mammalian brain. And suddenly we're operating at this eat, mate, or kill. We don't, we don't have access to our rational thinking at the moment of impulse. So when you're online at Starbucks and there's a big old chocolate bar in the counter, and as you're getting closer, you hear this voice inside your head that says, you know, Chocolate comes from cocoa beans, and cocoa beans grow on a plant, and chocolate's really a vegetable, and you're on this new diet which requires a lot of vegetables, so have at it. That's really your li lizard brain whispering to you, saying, you know, let me free, 
And for some reason, at the moment of impulse, it makes sense because these other things fade away. And so if your paradigm is, how do I love myself more at the moment the lizard brain is, is starting to talk to you, what you're going to do is make more room for this thing. You're going to try to love all parts of yourself. But see, this is not really you any more than your testicles are you or, the, or your stomach is you. Um, this is a bodily organ. It's, it is part of your survival drive. You can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But what makes you human is your ability to direct it in the right direction, direct it towards constructive goals. And so to do that at the moment of impulse, especially considering these hyperpalatable industrial food-like substances that we're facing and 7,000 advertising messages a year with billions of dollars behind them, virtually none of them which are about fruit or vegetables, like 7,000 food messages, hardly any of them are about fruit or vegetables, and the addiction treatment industry saying you can't quit even if you want to, the best you can do is abstain one day at a time, you're, you're powerless over this impulse. With that perfect storm of external forces conspiring to feed your lizard brain and the fact that your lizard brain is their best customer, um, what you really need is to, is to distance yourself from the lizard brain, to stop thinking of this thing as you, and to cultivate a sense of distaste for it at those moments of impulse. Because really, this thing is sociopathic. This thing doesn't care about family or love or tribe or society or long-term goals or anything like that. It'll run rampant over your health goals. It'll run rampant over your need to be a role model for your kids. It'll run rampant over your need to have a physical relationship with your spouse. All it wants is what it wants. Um, and so I decided I was going to call this thing my pig. I was going to call this my pig. Now, just for just so people just so people know, I think that pigs in the real world are very sweet animals. I like that you have a picture of a pig behind you. I think they actually need our help. They're being abused. The, the, the pig behind uh, me is actually smiling. <laughs> and, and, and pigs do smile. It, this is actually more like a wild hawk. It's more like a, a like a wild beast that doesn't care about anything. It just wants its pig slop. So I decided I would draw a very clear line in the sand that would make it. 100% unambiguous what was healthy and what was not healthy. And I would start, like he advised all my clients to start with, um, and by the way, a lot of this is against the standards of care of my, my practice, so I'm giving this advice and counsel as a coach and educator, not necessarily as a psychologist. Um, not as a psychologist. But I would make a line on the sand like, I will never eat chocolate again. Mm -hmm. Or it doesn't have to be I will never, there's nothing wrong with chocolate for a lot of people, but for me, my sister can take two little squares off of bar and and put the rest away for Sunday, and I don't I don't understand what's wrong with that woman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but for me, I really never was a lot easier than sometimes. So I say I'll never have chocolate again. And if that's true, then I immediately knew that any little voice in my head which suggested I should have chocolate either now or in the future, even one bite, would be the pig. What it was squealing for was pig slop, chocolate was pig slop, and what it said was pig squeal. And when I would hear that voice, I'd say, well, uh, I don't want chocolate, the pig does, I don't eat pig slop, I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And I'm always a little embarrassed at this point in the conversation because after having done, you know, seeing thousands of patients and spending 30 years suffering with my own food addiction and doing you know, tens of millions of dollars of consulting for big industry. This sophisticated psychologist figured out that he doesn't eat pig slop and he doesn't let farm animals tell him what to do. And that's what worked for me. It was a very crude, very primitive, but I think we need something very crude and primitive to distance ourselves from this, um, this lizard brain and get those extra microseconds that we need at the moment of impulse. And from there, Go on, Michael. I'm sorry. Oh, oh I, was, I was just going to say that, that having something that simple helps to make it, a, like we were talking about earlier, a black and white line in the sand because you go to grab something and you go, oh, wait, that's pig slop. Not going to yeah. touch it. Yep. Yeah. Belongs in a pig's trough, not on a human's plate. Yeah. Now, now that's for me personally. I don't. I would not tell anybody outside of the context of an interview that chocolate was pig slop. And, 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 and to be clear here, I, I absolutely love chocolate myself. I know for a while, if I had chocolate, it wasn't a piece or two of chocolate. It, it was all of the chocolate. So, yeah. so it, it makes a lot of sense. And, and this is jumping ahead, but, but I'll throw it in here as a little caveat. We're talking about making your own rules, not about chocolate's bad, this is bad. It's, it's all up to you. 
Yeah, so I, I discovered that it was really important for people to create their own food plan because what happens when you try to follow someone else's that you can use someone else's food plan as a guideline. You could have a dietary philosophy that you really believe in or a book that you read. But if you don't go through and articulate the rules of that plan and own them, what happens is your pig will say something like this. You know, that particular diet guru's plan is just not working for us. There's this wrong with it or that wrong with it, but we'll have to find someone else. And in the meantime, we can just keep on binging our faces off, right? It's called the grass is greener syndrome. There must be another diet. It's There's something wrong with this one. And the pig keeps you confused and ambivalent about what you should be following so that you can continue to binge. So the way, the way to overcome that is to develop your own planet. At the end of the interview, I can tell people where they can get some starter templates mm -hmm. and stuff, but yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, so, so going back, do we want to go back or should we talk about the, the four forces and get into big food? Sure. We can do all of that. We, 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 can, we, can, we can move in that direction. Yeah. So, so, okay. There were a series of studies in the late 50s and early 60s. The original researchers were named Milner and Olds. Mm -hmm. And what they did um, was that they wired up some rats' brains to the pleasure center. They put electrodes in the pleasure center of the rats' brains, and they connected those wires to a lever that the rats could use to self-stimulate their pleasure center. Um, this would not be an ethical study from vegan standards these days, but, but no. um, yeah. <laughs> but it was done, and there was some very interesting information that came out of it. And what, what happened was they found that these rats would push the levers thousands of times per day. We had <laughs> short-circuited the natural mechanisms which produced intense pleasure, and they would press them thousands of times a day. They did some follow-up studies to see would the rats choose to push these levers over their other best interests. So, for example, they took rats that were extraordinarily hungry, even starving, and it turns out that the rats would ignore healthy food in order to keep pressing the lever a thousand times a day. They took nursing mother rats who would abandon their pups would stop nursing their pups in order to press the lever thousands of times a day. They put a painful electrical grid between the rat and the lever, and the rats would cross the painful electrical grid to push the lever thousands of times a day. And so, and, and there were some similar studies done, done in humans later on, because people might say, well, rats are not people, but the brain structure is fairly similar and um, it's reasonably similar. And there was validation to show that this applied to humans. The um, thing that we can take away from this is that if we are given the means to artificially stimulate our pleasure centers mm -hmm. um, in ways that with, with stimuli that evolution did not prepare for us, did not provide for us, that the result in the mammalian brain is self-neglect, severe self-neglect. We, we, it says if the survival drive has been corrupted for... Um, you know, for industrial reasons. And that's, that's really what I believe is happening in industry today. I believe that um, we're concentrating as much sugar, salt, fat, starch, oil, excitotoxins, chemicals into a package, which we, you know, it, these things didn't exist in the tropics. There, there were no chips and bogs and faxes and cookies and um, we, we didn't have these things in the tropics as we were evolving. And so it's only really the last, you know, few hundred years that they're available. And it's not that different from being given a lever to artificially stimulate our pleasure centers. Um, then the packaging, the research that goes into packaging is astounding and making the food look like it's healthy. So, you know, we know that a variety of vibrant coloring is supposed to signal in nature the availability of a vibrant array of nutrients. Mm -hmm. So if, if you eat a salad or you know set of fruits and you mix up the colors and you have some darks and greens and brights and yellows, and you're most likely to get a full complement of nutrients and minerals. Well, I found out from one of the VPs of marketing at a very large food bar manufacturer that the key insight that made them extraordinarily profitable was to take the vitamins out of the bar because they were interfering with the taste and to focus all of the extra money and research on making the packaging look more vibrant and colorful and palatable instead. And then all the money that goes into advertising, and by the way, most people think 
that advertising doesn't work on them. But the big secret in the advertising industry is advertising works better on people who think it doesn't work on them because their sales resistance is down. And they would not be spending billions of dollars on the types of ads and jingles and um, you know, promotion that you see if that was not making back more billions of dollars for them. So d don't be naive. Don't think that the advertising is not working on you. Um, you're, you're being programmed day in and day out. There's some very clear and easy defenses against this, but it's, it's kind of like being in the matrix and taking you know, the red colored pill. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to do it. And it's, uh, it's upsetting when you first see it and you kind of feel like, well, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. But if you're willing to do that, it's not that hard to defend against. Let's talk about defending against. And, and one thing that comes to mind is when you talk about packaging, when you talk about, um, and we had on a, a gentleman last year, I wish I could remember his name, uh, talking about the Dorito effect, about, about all the chemical processes that go in. When we talk about creating a quote unquote food, because there's nothing really food about it. It's a mad science experience to tripwire our brain. Organic foods that are processed as well may as well fall, fall into this category, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. One of the big food industry lies is that um, because this food has X healthy quality, that means the rest of it is okay for you. So, for example, there are certain processes, certain roasting processes, which create chemicals called acrylamides. Mm -hmm. But if you're roasting the original organic nut or seed. Um, they can talk about the omega-3s that are, you know, it's rich in omega-3s because it comes from this seed or, um, you know, it, it could be low salt. Well, that's great. It's low salt, but it also causes cancer. And, and we as consumers, because these items are so pleasurable, we want to be lied to because we want to lie to ourselves. We want, we want to have the excuse that says, oh, I'm getting my omega-3s or, you know, oh, this is low salt. That's great. But what about the rest of it? So you really have to evaluate the complete food when you're deciding what you're going to have. So yeah. thank you so much. And from there, then let's, let's talk about how do we defend ourselves? Okay. Well, what you need to understand is that willpower is a fatigable muscle. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of research on why people towards the end of the day have more trouble making good, healthy decisions they do than they do in the beginning of the day. And it's, it's very clear that there are only so many good decisions we can make every day. It's very, very clear. Um, the thing that trumps willpower, however, is character. Mm -hmm. this, this is a little hard to follow. I'm going to try to give you some examples. Thank you. But, but what, what you want to do is to have made your difficult decisions beforehand so that every time that the previously difficult decision is presented to you, you're not taxing your willpower anymore because there's no decision to make. So, for example, let, let's say that I walk into a diner and the waitress sits me down at the table and she says, I'll be right back. I just have to go get you, get you a menu. Mm -hmm. And there's no window. There's nobody up front. I'm sitting at the table all by myself. And she left her $20 bill as a tip from the last customer on the table. Now, what do I do? Does it require any willpower for me not to take that $20 bill? Would it require any willpower for you? I, I would venture to say probably not. And 99% of the people that I ask say, no, I wouldn't take that $20 bill. And I'll say, why not? They say, well, I'm not a thief and I don't, I don't steal money from waitresses. And I'll say, well, so at some point along the way, you made a character decision. You decided to become the kind of person who would never take a $20 bill from a waitress no matter whether you wouldn't get caught, no matter whether it would be pleasurable for you, you decided you were not that kind of person. Mm -hmm. And what people don't realize is that we can make those kind of character decisions about just about anything we want to with regards to our impulses. So if I say, I will never have chocolate again, yep. that's a character decision. So every time I'm faced with a chocolate bar at the Starbucks now, I don't have to say, see, see it's a lot different than saying I'll avoid it 90% of the time. Because um, if I avoid it 90% of the time and I'm standing in front of Starbucks, I always have to make the decision, is this the 10% or this the 90%? You've got a default rule set now. It's, it's as simple as thou shalt not kill. If somebody slugs you on the street, all of a sudden you're not going to go to a completely different rule set because that's, that's hard set in stone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you say, if you ask people, could you 
could you never eat chocolate again? Almost everybody says, no, I couldn't do that. If I ask them, could you become the kind of person that never eats chocolate? A lot of people will say, yeah, I think I could do that. So people intuitively know that they can become a different kind of person if they want to, because over the course of their life, they've made character decisions and making one more is not a hard, hard thing. People are frightened of the word never. And there are other categories of food rules, and there's, you can make you can make conditional rules that say I'll never have it during the week again. I'll only have it on Saturdays and Sundays, or I'll only have it at social events, or I always eat six servings of fruit and vegetables every day, or I I always meditate before a meal. You can make all sorts of rules. Your own imagination is the only limitation. But people are very frightened of never. And if you want, we could talk a little bit more about how to get over that fear. But um, yeah, let's go there. Okay, so imagine you have a three-year-old child and you're walking towards a busy intersection and you say, you know, Johnny, you can never cross the street without holding daddy's hand. You can never, ever, 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 ever cross the street without holding daddy's hand. The reason you would say that to a three-year-old child, even though you know that when that kid is seven or eight years old, you're going to teach them how to look both ways and cross the street themselves is because you don't want them distracted by the possibility that they might want to do that. You want them to focus all of their energy on being safe. You don't want them, you don't want their mind wandering around with those possibilities. Well, it turns out it's the same way when you want to win a battle with food. Um, you need to know exactly where the bullseye is, right? So if you're shooting at a bullseye, you need to be able to see the boundaries of the bullseye. You don't, need, you don't want to have anything obstructing your vision. And you need to be able to purge all of the doubt and insecurity Almost so like, think of an Olympic archer. It's almost like they are the bullseye and they've seen the arrow going into the bullseye before they let it go. Mm-hmm. That, that's the focus and attitude that you want to have when you're aiming. Now, if you miss the bullseye, here's what you don't do. You don't turn around and shoot all the rest of the arrows to the audience and say, oh, F it, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a compulsive bullseye misser and I can't do that. No, you, you get up and you aim again. You, you take account, gee, maybe I didn't take account of the wind or you know, maybe I was a little further from the target than I thought I was. And you readjust and you take aim again. Mm-hmm. If you keep getting up and aiming with 100% commitment, commitment and purging that doubt and insecurity from your mind so that you really are the bullseye, your aim has to get better. Um, n- now, what happens in our culture is that we're told to aim for progress, not perfection. We're told to, we're told that if we're too strict about our goals, then we're going to have to necessarily beat ourselves and suffer tremendous guilt if we happen to miss. But I would tell you that that archer doesn't have to suffer tremendous guilt if they miss any more than you have to suffer tremendous guilt if you accidentally touch a hot stove. That archer just needs to pay attention to what the problem was, make adjustments and aim again. If you touch a hot stove, you don't say, screw it, I'm just going to always be a compulsive hot stove toucher, I might as well put my whole hand on it. You want to feel the pain for a moment, and that corresponds to a momentary sense of guilt or shame, mm-hmm. because you did make a, a commitment, you did, make a, did, um, you did fail to keep your word to yourself. But anything beyond that, and this is a really key point, anything beyond that level of guilt or shame, that momentary thing to get your attention, is really a pig's game, because what the pig wants you to do when it says, oh, you're pathetic, you're never going to get this, you're always going to be compulsively eating you know, chocolate or whatever other pig stop you went after, you're, you're too weak, don't even try to stop binging. The self-castigation, that criticism, is pig activity, it's pig squeal, and it's binge motivated. The whole purpose of it is to beat you down and make you feel too weak to resist. And so as a consequence, this is why it's difficult to continue binging if you refuse to yell at yourself. If, if all you do is pay attention to the mistake and get up and aim again, it's very, very diff- difficult to continue binging. There's actually kind of a masochistic pleasure involved in the self-castigation. Um, when, when you understand that, when you understand that this system is not recommending that you self-castigate, that, that you really should let go of that guilt and just pay attention and fix it, then you don't have to be as frightened of never. And when you understand that, it's entirely possible to change your food plan as you experiment and get education, even though the way that you present it to your lizard brain, the way you present it to your pig, you don't have to call it a pig, you can call it a slacker or a B-I-T-C-H or whatever you want to call it. The way that you present it is the same way you would present the fact that 
little Johnny can't cross the street when he's three years old as this is a hard line. This is just how it is because daddy said so. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to go back just, just what you said a minute ago, which is, is you will, um, if I get the exact name for it, and, and I wrote it down earlier because it was one of the things uh, that really struck me in the book. You say it's impossible to binge if you refuse to yell at yourself. Very, very difficult to binge if you refuse to yell at yourself. I, I got that from Carol Munter, by the way, who has an entirely different philosophy of how to stop overeating. But um, I thought that she was right about that. So what that means, in essence, is stop picking on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only, the only self-forgiveness is a very big part of overcoming eating disorders, um, even overcoming simple overeating. You absolutely have to forgive yourself no matter how many times you've made a mistake in the past and get up and aim again. If, if you continue to allow the self-castigation, you're only going to fuel the binges more. Fantastic. Or not so fantastic as, as the case may be. And, and going along with that is, is labeling ourselves. I, I'm a slacker. I can't do it. Um, I always fall down on, on my diet. These are all, are all a pig squeal, you would say. Yeah. When the pig tells you that there's nothing different about what you're doing now, that you've always fallen down, so you always will fall down, what you, first of all, you have to tell the pig that it doesn't have a time machine, so it doesn't know what's going to happen in the future. And the only time that you can binge is now, even tomorrow morning or even you know next week or whenever the pig is prognosticating that you're going to binge, it will still be now. So all you have to do is never binge now, and then you can never binge again. This sounds like an Eckhart Tolle book. <laughs> never, never binge now, or, or <laughs> <laughs> he's great. He's binge great, here, yeah. binge here now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, that, go that's that, that's what the pig would say: is binge here now. Yeah. And so all we have to do is not binge in this moment, and then not binge in the next moment. But if we've made those character decisions, it's going to make it easy moment, easier moment for moment not to binge. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing you can tell the pig at those times is that it's actually complimenting you. It thinks that it's putting you down because it says you've tried so many times. But actually, that's the psychology of winning. Winners fall down seven times, they get up eight times. That's the psychology of winning. So it's complimenting you. And um, yeah. I, I like it. Let's, let's talk real briefly about creating our own food plan and what it means to own it 100%. Well, um, you can create it any way that you want to. And a food plan is comprised of a set of food rules. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend people start with just one rule um, so they can learn how this game is played because it's this is counterculture. This is not the way that most people manage their food. This is very different than um, how you're taught on commercials and radio and what you've seen from a therapist or something like that. So I recommend they pick their single most troublesome um, food or trigger or eating behavior. Mm -hmm. And then I give people four categories just as a starting point. Um, there are endeavors, like yeah. I will never eat chocolate again. There are conditionals, like I will only ever eat pretzels at a major league baseball park again. Um, there are always, like I, I always breathe for 30 seconds before I go back for seconds. Or I always write down my uh, hypothetical food plan before I go to sleep for the next day so I know where all the trouble might be. Um, and then there are, un there are unrestricteds, and I recommend including that category so that you can always know that you're not going to starve. So, you know, maybe I can have as many unsauced leafy green vegetables as I want to, or as much coffee or tea, or as much water, or it's different for different people in their own philosophy. But those four categories, ne nevers, conditionals, always, and unrestricted, it's a good way to start thinking about how you develop a food plan. Um, and to own it 100%, is to define a binge as mm -hmm. taking one step off of that food plan. I take a lot of flack for this because people say, wait, if you're going to tell people a binge is taking one step off the food plan, then, then does that mean that you're going to encourage them to binge more if they take a step off? Because you know how a lot of people are. If they make one mistake, they say, screw it, I'll start again tomorrow. And I'll say, no, that's a pig squeal also. As a matter of fact, that might be the most damaging pig squeal. Every single bite counts. The moment that you recognize that you've broken the law. You don't keep breaking the law more. You go back and you adhere to the law again. Um, and I want people to think of one bite off of the plan as a binge because you, you can think of degrees of binges if, you, if that helps you. But I want them to see the boundaries of the bullseye. I want them to know exactly when they're on or exactly when they're off. 
And then you'll say, I will never binge again. I will never binge again. Um, and that says, you know, I am committed to being the kind of person who follows this plan 100%. So, if, so an example would be, um, well, in your case, is chocolate, or it could be saying, I will not have potato chips, for instance, or donuts. And then if we were to have one chip, that's considered a binge so that we can keep clear on the gray zone and say, whoop, stop, I won't do that again. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's all it is. Yeah. Fantastic. So what do we do when we start to get cravings? So, so when that part of the brain is speaking to us, it's got, it's got big food on the brain and, and it's saying, I, I need my, my salt and my oil and my, my God knows what. Give it to me. Give it to me now. What do we do to control the pig? Well, a couple of things. The first thing you do is you remind yourself that I don't have cravings. My pig does. See, we can't eliminate our lizard brain. We can't eliminate the cravings entirely, although they, they die down a lot quicker than you think when you stop feeding them because of the principle of neuroplasticity. But what we can do is commit 100% to separating our personal human identity from the identity of the lizard brain. Mm -hmm. And so at the moment of the craving, the first thing you do is say, my pig wants that, I don't. And the reason that's helpful uh, is because you are inserting the separation between you and the pig, and it allows for that next sentence, which says, you know, my pig wants that, but I never eat that. So it allows you to remember who you are. But, Michael, the other thing that is, that's important to remember is that once you find you have the ability to set these rules and get these you know, foods or food behaviors out or conditionally out of your life, you have to be careful not to get carried away with that power and create a caloric or nutritional restriction that makes you physiologically uncomfortable. Because while it is possible to override any impulse, it can become progressively more difficult if you are starving yourself in any way, shape, or form. Because mm -hmm. I, I thoroughly believe that there's an evolutionary mechanism in our brain that says, if we go through periods where calories or nutrition are not available, then the moment that they are available, we better hoard as many as we can. And so it's really, really important that your food plan remains nutritionally complete. And usually what I have to do with people who go through these, you know, periods of being really good and then periods of being really bad is I have to slowly convince them to eat more and lose weight more slowly. I, I cringe when people come to me and tell me they're losing five pounds a week. Because I, I, just, I just know it's going to reverse in the wrong direction. So I just, I just know it. So I tell them, you know, a pound, maybe a pound and a half a week is really good. Um, and let's, let's learn how to stop the binges and just eat normally. And that's, that's what I find is really the solution to, um, to overeating and binge eating. Thank you. And, and since you brought up weight, can you tell us why the scale may not actually be the, the evil boop that we think it is? Well... Okay. Um, I had the privilege of consulting for Stephen Covey a little bit before he died. And one of the things that he told me was that a plane en route from New York to Los Angeles is off course 99.9% .9 of the time. And the only reason that it gets from New York to Los Angeles and lands on a runway with you know, maybe a three-foot margin of error um, 3,500 miles away is because all along the way, the pilots are looking at the instruments and making corrections for those little deviations off course. Now, I wouldn't want to get on a plane where the pilot said, you know, it really upsets me when I'm a little bit off course, and it makes me want to go even further off course, so I'm not going to bother checking until I'm about uh, halfway across the country. And the reason I don't want to get on that plane is because I want to go to Los Angeles, not Alaska. And so it doesn't make sense to me that because we have these emotional reactions to the scale that we shouldn't avail ourselves of this data. Um, and I've, I found, I, I recently got divorced and I suddenly found that it was a lot easier to clean up little messes than big messes. Um, so if I'm always kind of looking around and seeing if there's a little mess when I clean it up, then my apartment miraculously stays clean. Mm -hmm. You'd think after 52 years, I would have known that, but I didn't. Um, and it's the same thing with the scale. It's a lot easier to, to stop a small weight gain than a big weight gain. Um, and what you need to understand though 
is that the pig wants you to overreact to any one given measurement. And so you, you want to keep track. There, there are applications online that will allow you to plot the trends and kind of smooth out the effect of any given measurement. But, you know, um, if the weight's up a little bit, it could be because you had a salty dinner last night or because you didn't have a BM before you weighed yourself or, you know, because you had your period or any of a million other reasons besides the fact that you actually gain, you know, three pounds of fat, which is very difficult to do in one day. And um, so I, I really believe people should take measurements every day, um, you know, put them in a spreadsheet or put them in one of these applications online that shows you the trend that you're experiencing. And over time, you will start to understand how all those little factors that cause the little blips up and down really don't matter and what the actual movement is. Um, and you can take advantage of the data. So I, I wouldn't want to drive my car without looking at the speedometer. I wouldn't want to, you know, put a cardboard shield over the, over the windshield while I was driving. I, so I don't want to manage my weight without a measuring device to give me feedback. Thank you. What, what about people who are, are so incredibly wrapped up that their whole rever world revolves around, am I staying on the right diet? Am I doing the right thing? Am I not doing the right thing? How much do I eat? How much do I not eat? Who, who they end up doing this kind of dance with the scale. Well, okay. The psychologist in me would answer differently than the author in me to that question. So I'm going to answer as the author first. Okay. Um, and thank you. You're welcome. The, there's a mental obsession that develops when you haven't clarified your relationship and your decision points with difficult foods and behaviors. And if there is ambiguity in your food plan and you haven't made those decisions beforehand, then you're leaving the door open for the pig to constantly throw thoughts at you to try to run at 100 miles an hour through a yellow light. So... so a big part of the solution to that is to go through all of your troublesome food triggers and behaviors and make decisions beforehand and commit to those decisions. And you'll find that your mind quiets down dramatically. This is kind of a hack for the monkey mind. If you were to talk in Eastern terms, your mind is going to quiet down dramatically because there are no decisions to make. Um, like a prisoner that's been given a life sentence, eventually the pig loses hope. So right now it's telling you, you could never do this. You're going to be tortured forever. But what happens when you stop and you stop feeding the pig is that your survival drive starts to reorient towards where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. If a smoker stops smoking and instead when it, he has a craving, he goes out and takes three deep breaths of cool, crisp forest air, then his lungs are going to readjust and stop making that biological error. They're no, no, longer, going to, no longer going to think that Smoke is oxygen because smoke isn't oxygen. It's the same thing with food. If you're having, you know, cookies and bags and looking for love at the bottom of a, you know, container, then your your lizard brain thinks that that's where the survival that's where the survival goods are. But if you stop doing that and instead you have, I, I tell people if their doctors allow it and most doctors will, what if you blend up a a blender full with a half a pound of leafy green vegetables and some water? Um, you're going to find, as crazy as it sounds, you're not supposed to believe me. Every bone in your body is supposed to think I'm full of SH. Um, you're not going to believe me. But if you do this, you're going to start to find that your cravings readjust towards more natural, wholesome things. It, I, it's just, I have done this specifically. Oh, uh, I had blood sugar challenges for almost my entire life, and it ended mm, probably about four years ago after I did basically what you're saying each and every morning, hmm. which was got as many greens in me. I didn't even do fruits at the time. Now I'd, I'd put the fruits in, but as many greens as I could into me, and the palate completely readjusted, and, and maybe it was the greens or maybe it was getting away from the processed foods. Everything got level and my ability to, I can eat fruit now without my blood sugar crashing. I totaled yep. a car once from a glass of orange juice about 20, wow. 25 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even speaking of that, you know, even the American Diabetic Association thinks that fruit is a, a decent thing for people to have. And they use the guar and pectin in fruit to treat diabetes. So... I think that fruit has been demonized along with other processed sugars. We could talk. I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but I have a lot of thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 
So, so readjusting your survival drive, moving your survival drive in that direction by feeding yourself more leafy green vegetables and fruits and whole fresh ripe raw, you know, produce ma makes all the difference in the world in my experience. So, and then did you want to throw your psychology hat on or did that, that fully cover it there? Um, well, my psychology hat does say that even though I see food addiction as a more external problem, which is caused by the forces we've talked about in um, addiction treatment and advertising and big food, um, it does reorient the personality and it might be helpful to talk to a psychologist about that so that you can understand what, what happens when you stop overeating is that all of a sudden there you are and you're, you're very present with mm -hmm. all of the problems and conflicts and, you know, feelings that you had difficulty dealing with before. Now, I don't want people to think that emotional problems cause overeating. I don't want them to think that. Um, and I specifically don't want people to think they're eating for comfort because you, what people are eating when they say they're eating for comfort are these industrial foods by and large. And these industrial foods, they get you hot. Th these are um, these are concentrated sources of pleasure that don't exist in nature. Another name for that is a drug. And people take drugs to get high. They don't take drugs just for comfort. They take drugs to get high. I think it's important to highlight the difference that people are actually getting high with food because it's, um, it's syntonic for people. It's consistent with their identity to say, well, I deserve some comfort. Um, and the pig can use that to say, you know, please, please feed me. I'm, I'm so hungry and I had such a hard day and, you know, I need a hug. And, um, I can't get a hug, but maybe, maybe a chocolate bar would be better. Um, <laughs> and you don't want to let that go on anywhere. As a matter of fact, you might want to tell your pig you're willing to feel any degree of discomfort in order to stop overeating. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not syntonic for people. It's dystonic for them to consider the idea of getting high with food. Most people don't want to think of themselves as a drug addict. And that makes a... Um, that makes a big difference. Thank you. On, on that note, just a few questions, and we'll dive into a brief wrap-up and see if there's time for a short meditation. Um, what is one or two of the most common food industry lies that we got to watch out for? Well, we talked about one of them, which says that um, if this food has this, um, if it has X ingredient, which is good for you, then you don't have to worry about Y ingredient, which is bad for you. And that's that's very, very common. There are other things like the calories per serving, but they make the serving just so infinitely small that no one would ever eat that, but it's legal to do that. So, you know, some of those buttery sprays, they can make the serving size so small that like you're supposed to have one little spritz, but nobody has one little spritz. Everybody has 10 spritzes on their, on their thing. Uh, and so the calories could actually say zero. I've seen situations where the cal calories say zero. Um, but most people are having 20 or 30 calories every time that they spray it on. So th there are things like that that the food industry can um, can get by you pretty easily and perfectly legally. Thank you. From there, one of the big challenges we have is what do we do to neutralize other people's pigs? Well, what you need to understand is that having a conversation about what's healthy food versus unhealthy food is the best way to give someone else's pig power. Um, and that one man's pig slop is another person's healthy treat. And what people really want if they're saying, oh, come on, have a piece of this chocolate cake. I made it just for you. It's your favorite. What they, what they really want is to be loved and to feel like it's okay that they eat what they eat. And they're trying to preserve a sense of tribal norm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe, you know, 20,000 years ago, as we were evolving, Food was scarce. It was necessary that everybody shared the same thing that was eaten. Every tribe member was necessary in order to, you know, produce and hunt and everything they had to do. And so there may have been this um, this evolutionary pressure on people to all eat the same way. St step out of line and I'll kill you. And those feelings are very entrenched in our culture today. People want to people want everyone in the tribe to be eating the same thing. And so. What you want to do is find a way to make these people feel loved and like it's okay that they're eating what they're eating without getting into this conversation about why you're not necessarily eating it. So one thing you could do is say, 
let's say my mom offers me a piece of chocolate cake. I say, mom, that, that looks really delicious, but you know, my, my stomach's not quite perfect right now. Do you, do you have maybe some mint tea or even some Pepto-Bismol? Um, and the reason that could work is that you're giving her a way to give you another love gift. Like the, the part of the purpose of giving you the cake was to say, here, welcome to my tribe. Let's mm-hmm. break bread together. Um, I love you. I, I, you belong here just like I belong here. And so you don't want to reject that um, without giving her a way to do the same thing otherwise. That's, that's one way you could do it. Um, you, you can also just say, you know, it's not, not really my thing. My doctor doesn't want me to. Um, she'll say why. I'll say, well, it's nothing serious. I just hate talking about it. And they'll usually go on to something else. So there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, and I, I actually have a whole recording about that that people can go through um, on my site if they want to. Fantastic. What's a personal pig squeal journal? Personal pig squeal journal is once you've made a rule, like I will never eat chocolate again, your pig is going to work really, really hard to find some way to convince you. And even if there are a couple of pig squeals you're, you're familiar with and you know how to deal with, it's going to come up with new ones. And so what you want to do is every morning get up and say, um, okay, pig, can you give me just one good reason to have chocolate? And let the pig do its best to convince you. Um, when you're prepared for it like that, you've taken away the element of surprise. And when you ask it at a time, you know, after you've eaten something healthy and you're not really hungry, um, it can't do, it really can't do that much damage. You put it in writing and you'll recognize it later on and you can ignore it. Fantastic. I, I want to put on my coach's hat for a second. I always like to give people homework. So they're not just listening. They're going to do something here today. What one homework assignment would you give people to, um, <laughs> to put their pig in a cage today? Um, think about your most difficult trigger food and behavior. Maybe it's eating standing up and make a rule that says, I will never eat standing up again. Or if you want to make an exception for a social event or something like that, like that you can make it conditional. But make one rule that governs that behavior, one rule that governs the food. I will never have chocolate again. I'll only have chocolate and birthday parties. Once you've made that rule, um, keep your pig squirrel journal every morning. Mm-hmm. to listen for all the reasons that your pig says that you should have it and learn how to play this game. Declare yourself 100% confident that you'll never do it again and watch your pig go to work trying to convince you that that's not possible. Write down all the pig squeals and start ignoring them. Fantastic. My wife, Jessica, she's the producer of the show. She always wants me to ask a question for parents, for their kids. You mentioned earlier that you were, you were babysat, soothed by chocolate. Well, what's, what's one thing that parents can do to help their kids so that they're not having to tame a pig? Well, you have to remember that children will do 75% of what you do and 25% of what you say. So the, the first thing that you want to do is... Um, take care of yourself. Be, be a role model. Lead by example. Yeah, that, that, that's, really, that's really the best thing that you can do. Um, otherwise, I like to have, you know, you can, if we go back to the green smoothies, there are, um, you can make a spinach smoothie with some, you know, non-alkalized cocoa powder or some carob powder and some dates in it. And the kids won't know that it's a healthy treat. They'll, they won't taste the spinach in it. They'll, they'll be all excited about the um, taste of the carob and the sweet. And you'll get, some, you'll get a lot of healthy greens into them and, and orient their survival drive where it needs to be. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> where yeah. can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book? Well, I can give you a copy of that for free on the Kindle or Nook or a PDF if you don't have a Kindle or a Nook. Um, along with, see, Michael, you and I have been talking about this all in theory, um, and it's a little bit of a harsh harsh idea in theory, but if you listen to me coach people through it, mm-hmm. it's actually a very compassionate way to, and exciting way to, to stop off reading. So I recorded a whole bunch of coaching sessions, and I recorded a whole bunch of food plan starter templates for any diet that you happen to want to follow, paleo, vegetarian, vegan, macrobiotic, calorie counting, whatever you want to do. You can get that all at neverbingeagain.com. Just click on the big red more button to get the free reader bonuses. Sign up for that, and you'll get, get all that. Fantastic. Neverbingeagain.com. 
Thank you. And, and if you're driving down the road and you dev didn't catch neverbingeagain.com, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over as well. So any last words of wisdom before, if we have time, we jump into a really brief meditation? Well, Jim Rohn said that a life of discipline is better than a life of regret. And I wish that I'd heard that quote years ago. Because I used to think that discipline interfered with freedom, but I now believe that freedom sits on top of discipline. I think that a, a jazz pianist can't really soulfully improvise unless they know their skills. Um, I think that we couldn't drive where we wanted to drive in our cars if it weren't for all the lights and stop signs and things that protect us from danger. Um, being disciplined to look at a map or use Google Maps these days. Uh, so, so freedom sits on top of discipline. Don't be frightened of the disciplines. Embrace the disciplines that we're talking about. And the mental freedom, the ability to reach your health and fitness goals is just astounding. Woohoo! So, <laughs> thank you so much for being on the show. This has been absolutely fantastic. Would you have time for a really short meditation? Yes. How much time do we have? Uh, three to eight minutes, anything of your call. Let's call it four minutes, okay? Perfect. Thank you, Glenn. Well, what I'd like you to do is, um, if you're driving, please pull over. And I'd like you to put both feet on the ground mm -hmm. and find yourself in a very comfortable position. You can just be aware of your breathing, be aware of the sound of my voice. You know, this isn't hypnosis or any type of mind control. It's just me talking to you in a very soft way to guide you through a... Um, a peaceful day. And as you are sitting there, I'd like you to close your eyes. You can open them anytime you really want to. And as you take a breath in and a breath out and a breath in and a breath out, I'd like you to imagine that there's a door that appears in front of you. And it's a door that you've never seen before. And you know the moment you see this door that it leads to someplace entirely different. Being the curious type in your mind's eye, you walk up towards the door and you see that there are words on the door. And it says, my most peaceful day with food. My most peaceful day with food. And so you walk through the door in your mind's eye and you find yourself in an entirely different scene. It may or may not have anything to do with the words that you saw. But it is a peaceful scene. You can get back anytime you want to. The door is always open. And I just want you to see what you see, hear what you hear, feel what you feel, experience it with all your five senses, touch, taste, and smell, and sound, and wind in your face, whatever you happen to see or feel. And really look around and see what your most peaceful day with food might look like. And as you are slowly preparing to leave this place, I'd like you to imagine that there's an item that appears on your right, right by, right about hips, hips height. And this is an item you can take back with you to help you remember your most peaceful day with food. So I want you to explore the item. If you need to shrink it down, you have the power to do that. I want you to slowly Walk back through the door that brought you here. Find yourself seated with your two feet on the floor in a grounded and relaxed state. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and tell me as much or as little as you feel comfortable with about what you saw and what you brought back. Michael, would you like to be the guinea pig for the audience? I had the darndest time. That was weird. I'm up on a hilltop, hilltop having the tiniest little picnic outside of Aix-en-Provence, France, wow. about 20 years ago. And the mood was so perfect. And, and, and we had like brie and crackers. But I was so into the mood that I didn't even feel like having much of the cheese and crackers. That was almost a, a compliment to it. The strangest thing is, when you asked what I brought back, and, and I don't eat as a general rule brie or crackers these days. In fact, I'm vegan, so I don't eat much in the brie category. Um, you asked me a food to bring back, and the darndest thing popped into my head. An onion. I huh. love 
onions, but since we moved two months ago to this island in North Carolina, I haven't had my regular access, as strange as it is, I can find them, to onions, and I haven't been having them. And it popped up that my body is going, give me an onion. That's wonderful. That's terrific. In, in the most peaceful state, that's what she would bring back. That's fabulous. It was very that's obscure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm vegan too, by the way. My, my, diet is, my um, book is diet agnostic, but I'm vegan too. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing. This has been wonderful. A, a true treasure and a treat. There's one, one last question I've got to ask since I didn't get to it earlier. What personally brings you the greatest uh, happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? Um, I think it's the moment that people realize that they aren't their pigs, that they really can separate from the lizard brain. And I know that I've installed this algorithm in their head that's going to grow and grow and grow and protect them. Um, because I, I suffered for so long with this. It was really 30 years of torture with, um, with food for me. And, you know, having figured it out and being blessed to have the opportunity to help so many people do this is just, um, just astounding for me. There are a lot of other ways I can make a lot more money, but this is what I love to do. So, and, and it makes a huge, huge difference in the world because at least in the Western world, the majority, I have no percentage to put on it. You may have a better idea than me. We're, we're crazed by foods because it's a society where we're told to be thin and then we're fed with chemical bombs. Yep. Yeah. It's a schizophrenic society. Yeah. It's a schizophrenogenic message. So thank you so much, Glenn. This has been a true honor, a, a treasure, and a treat. Everybody, go on out. Get Never Binge Again. Have fun with that pig, but not by feeding it. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get Never Binge Again, and starve out your inner pig today. And Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Poor piggy. And shine bright. Woohoo! Thanks, man. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>